Okay. Hello, and welcome to Assistive Technology Week. We are so excited to welcome members of the ALS community from the Mid-Atlantic Territory and beyond. My name is Jessica Taylor, and I am one of the Assistive Technology Specialists with the ALS Association. Our presenter for this session will be Lisa Bruning. For our live audience, please feel free to enter questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. There will be time at the end for Lisa to answer your questions. This webinar is being recorded and the recordings will be available on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. I will drop a link to the YouTube channel in the chat or we'll make it available to you so you can check out our previous Technology Week presentations. This recording will also be played on Zoom at 3 p.m. today using the same link as this meeting. I now have the honor of introducing one of my fellow speech language pathologists, Ms. Lisa Bruning. Lisa has been employed at the ALS Association since June 2002. She is currently the Director of Care Services and a licensed speech language pathologist with 30 years of experience working with persons with diverse communication impairments and implementing assistive technology plans of care. Her family's connection to ALS through her maternal grandfather's illness and death when her mother was a young child heightened her awareness of the issues affecting persons living with ALS, as well as the needs of their family members even years into the future. Lisa is an energetic and engaging presenter who enjoys interactive discussion and debate. She leveraged her grade school teacher's assessment of talks too much into a lifelong career of providing education, advocacy, and intervention to improve, maintain, and restore clients' communication skills. In her free time, Lisa enjoys research, learning, travel, home improvement projects, hiking, biking, and gardening. Her interest in technology extends to the use of power tools in home improvement. Thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you to the Mid-Atlantic Territory this is the third year of the Assistive Technology Week and looking through the other presentations coming up this week, it's gonna be a great week. Um, and just so thank you to Reagan and thank you to Jessica and all of the Mid-Atlantic team for inviting me here today. So just a quick highlight, um, every morning, as Jessica said, uh, there'll be live presentations. Um, so we have the whole cast of characters coming up. So iTech Digital, Voice It App, tips and tricks for ADLs and inclusive technology with the Skyle. So thank you for joining us today and uh, we'll kick this off. So the, um, my presentation is very, very high level. Um, so feel free to ask questions. Um, we'll probably save most of those to the end if, you, if that's okay with everyone on, on the call. And um, so it's a very high level introduction of assistive technology and augmentative communication. So just first, a, a shout out to all the other care service uh, team members who are here with us today online um, across the association and other ALS groups who may be joining us. Um, we are, uh, I still over 21 years have been here and I know that with the mission and the uh, motivation of helping families connect to learn about ALS um, through in-person and virtual email, phone and text uh, facilitating education programs, assisting with um, learning and teaching about appropriate equipment, getting connected to specialists, and providing local and national resources and referrals is um, definitely a much needed service still. Even with all of the internet help out there, you can't replace being in person. So my mouse is not deciding to uh, click when we want. So just a little bit about the ALS Association. Uh, we do fund global research, nationwide advocacy, and local care. Um, the assistive technology team and uh, the DC, Maryland, Virginia chapter and the Mid-Atlantic Territory has had one of the longest working technology teams. So my hat's off to them and Reagan and Jennifer Mundy and this team. And the assistive technology team, uh, our goal is to support an individual's desire to remain in contact with their medical team and their loved ones throughout the course of their illness to be independent, control, and interact with the daily environment and people in the ways that they desire. So um, what is assistive technology? And that can vary from person to person and the definitions are wide across. And so in a very wide and vague open-ended 
assistive technology is any piece of equipment that helps somebody perform a task that they may not have been able to do before. So anything to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities. And if you look at the little icons on there, you'll see that assistive technology helps in everything that we do every day. And we all use them no matter if we're if we have quote a disability or what we're working on. So the good thing about the time that we're living in now is that technology is accessible, it's mostly affordable, and it helps us all um, in a um, create in the world in the way that we want. So different abilities require different technologies. Um, our primary goals and the goals for this talk are mostly to kind of introduce you to the concepts of assistive technology and uh, dive a little bit deeper into communication devices and augmentative communication, which is my area of specialty. So um, the primary goals of assistive technology for those who, who need this are maintaining face-to-face -face and distance communication, uh, primarily if insurance is going to fund this with their medical team um, and with their care team, loved ones as well, being able to call for help, um, alternative access to communication, and a whole host of things that we want to interact with our with our lives and in our home. Um, so how do you choose the right technology? So um, typically you want to work with professionals and uh, through, through the ALS Association, through your medical clinic, through your rehab team, you may have access to professionals who have specialists in occupational therapy, rehab engineers, physical therapy, speech language pathologists, assistive technology professionals. So um, these are just a smattering. There's at least uh, three or four other organizations that are oversight for these professionals and ways to get more help. Um, the question we get asked all the time is who pays for all of this technology? And like we said earlier, it could be things that are very simple and don't cost anything, like settings in your um, on, on your laptop or on your computer, there's accessibility settings that are built in. So you could have an on-screen keyboard, you could use a head mouse, you could use Dwell, you don't have to type on a keyboard. So some of those things are already built in, while others of them are more and more affordable every day and are many times at your local home improvement store. But if you need funding for some of the more expensive things, we could look at private health insurance sometimes, um, depending on if you have a long-term care plan, some voc rehab and uh, nonprofit agencies are probably the most um, widely funded. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a state technology program, which uh, many people don't, uh, don't ever know to look at, is the, some of those fees that are on your telecommunications bills do support the state technology programs. Some of them are um, very limited in what they have available. Some of them have very restrictive loan periods, but it's definitely something to look at in your state technology program, since we're already paying for it through our taxes and our telecommunications bills. Um, so just, a, a, this is not my specialty area. I haven't done a lot of assistive technology in recent years, but um, instead of just connecting that through um, speech generating devices and, and learning about things that are making my life easier, especially since uh, COVID and being able to uh, automate things in your house. In the old days, we used um, assistive technology with the old um, the timers for your lights so that when we get into the darker days of winter and it gets dark at 5 p.m. here, then you'll automatically want to set your timers to turn your lights on. Nowadays, you can control that all from your Apple HomeKit or your Google HomeKit, your phone, your communication device um, through smart speakers, smart plugs, light bulbs. Um, people often think, well, I, I can't use my hands, so how would I do that? But most of these are speech recognition, and the coolest thing is watching um, the voice output on your phone or a communication device actually control things in your environment. Um, amazing to be able to have all of this control so much easier now. Um, the main purposes are for care partners to check in on you, for you to alert somebody when you have a need. You can set up daily medication reminders, if not for yourself, for your care partners as well. Um, you can make phone calls to neighbors and friends and loved ones. Um, it's highly restricted and, and not well um, encouraged to use 911 to call. Um, I do, my disclaimer is that we do have had, we have had some people do this in the past and when that was their only other option. So 
environmental controls, and then of course the entertainment. So we're going to switch a little bit more into um, speech generating devices and communication. And I, I caught, I want people to think of things a little bit differently. So um, we're, we're working hard every day to find new treatments and therapies and access to these therapies and affordable therapies. But until we have that cure, um, being able to control things, interact with your environment and, and technology is that um, symptom management that we cannot forget to talk about with our families. So, so everyone always asks, when's the right time for augmentative and alternative communication? And so augmentative and alternative communication is the fancy term that speech language pathologists use for um, anything that we do to try to supplement your speech, try to uh, replace your speech, or just make it a little bit easier. So augment, how are we going to augment? Are we going to use a letter board? Are we going to text words? Are we going to try to spell um, words so that the, your listener can understand? Um, so that's how we're augmenting or alternative where we're using different um, apps or paper letter boards or communication devices to do that. It's not always happy to hear, but you probably need to start this earlier than what you're thinking and perhaps maybe before you're really ready to face that. Um, it, it can take four to eight weeks to get through the evaluation process and make a decision of really what's going to work within your home. Um, sometimes speech pathologists who have this training are very difficult to find. Um, they are um, not always supported in a home care model because of the time it takes to borrow devices if the, uh, most home care agencies don't own these devices. So they have to coordinate with a vendor to bring a vendor out to your home so that you could actually see what or to their clinic. So you could actually see what these devices are. So that could take four to eight weeks. And then it could take an additional eight to 12 weeks for insurance approval and delivery. In some cases during COVID and supply chain issues, sometimes it was taking even longer than that. So, and I want to caution you that you're not giving up and you're not giving in and you're not replacing your speech. We're reframing the problem and we're looking at, these are just an added tool to maintain independence because we all use multimodal communication strategies every day. The mom look, and so some of the icons there, you can see the facial expressions, the eye roll, um, gestures, signals, um, instead of groans, maybe we should do sighs, right? Like, all right, fine. Um, facts, talking, and emojis are everywhere now. So this is not anything different. We're just asking you to add other pieces to your communication. The other piece that something uh, is important to point out and is often difficult to hear is that those with the bulbar onset, so they have speech, um, speech intelligibility, speech and swallowing issues first with their diagnosis and impairment. Um, what we have noticed and research is showing that um, obviously when your um, near cranial nerves and that area of your brain are affecting your speech, then we definitely have those symptoms first. And so it's 18 to 23 months often from symptom, on, symptom onset. If we're looking at just from how long it takes to the speaking rate to decrease to less than 120 words per minute. Um, it, it averages around 32 months based on when intelligibility falls lower than 85%. Obviously, it makes more sense that spinal onset then would have intelligible speech or functional usable speech even at 60 months post-symptom onset, but this can be highly variable depending on how your um, breathing is affected or your diaphragm is affected. We can't speak unless we have the air to generate from our diaphragm. So speaking, swallowing, and breathing are all very much interdependent. So having too much saliva in your mouth, not being able to swallow, not being able to have the air to say as many words as you want and your length of utterance, having to rephrase and, and drop down to maybe two words per breath, definitely all impacts your communication and um, functional abilities. So general cutoff points to consider, and for those that are the speech pathologists or writing these reports um, for Medicare, I'm going to tell you that I do put research notes in. I put footnotes in, I put these things in. I don't want them telling me that it's not medically necessary. So I do put in like a speaking rate, what their words per minute is. Um, generally at a cutoff of 125 words per minute or less is the recommended um, time to trigger an AAC evaluation. 
I'm hoping that you're about, you're already involved with a interdisciplinary clinic and somebody is monitoring this. It doesn't have to be within clinics. We have the articles listed below. They were, they were able to monitor speaking rate um, through phone conversations. Um, the DDK assessment, again, for the speech people on is the those uh, fun things that you do when you see the speech pathologist, like pa pa pa, ta ta ta, ka ka ka, and then put it all together, padaka padaka padaka, or buttercup buttercup buttercup. So there is um, data showing that some of your scores, their standardized scores, can help identify either slow or fast progressors. Um, it's it's we're always typically very intelligible, but so even just falling below ninety seven percent, which I would never consider really, most of us would never consider having to use AAC or speech sharing devices in between 80 and 85 and 95% because that's still that much of the time you're still highly effective. But it's abnormal when it falls below 97% and abnormal when it's under 160 words per minute. As a comparison, I'm probably speaking 200 to 300 words per minute. So I always have to remind myself to slow down, especially with our counterparts from the South. So When's the best time to use AAC um, and what's the best to use? Whatever works. What works for you and your loved ones to get that communication um, situation across, that message across, is what works. And so it's no one size fits all and we communicate everywhere. So in some situations, it may be a letter board. In some situations, it may be a gesture. It may be a facial expression. And some people that may not be familiar with you, new to your care team, you might have to use an app on your phone or a communication device. So again, so types of AAC that we're looking at here is augmentative first, so changing speech strategies. People say, but I'm already talking slower. But yes, we sometimes want you to speak even slower. We want you to over-articulate. We want you to slow down to give those weak muscles and slow muscles in your lips and your tongue time to get to where they need to make those contacts. If you can and you have the air power, we'd like you to speak a little bit louder, or you could use, a. Um, we'll get into that on the next one down, um, phrasing and reducing backwardness all help with that. Um, we do have rapid, rapid access, um, trying to get away from the term of low tech, but non-electronic, letter boards, pacing boards, paper and pen, uh, boogie boards. Um, the, the advent of iPhones and uh, smartphones and Google uh, Samsung devices have revolutionized and re reduced the cost for people being able to get apps on their um, on their phone that they carry with them all the time. And it's really reduced the stigma because everybody has their phone all the time or a tablet. Um, I still see lots of people who open up the notes on their, their notes app and just type on there and have somebody read it. Um, so they don't often know that there is an app that could provide spoken output. Um, I've also seen people just open up a general text message and type in there and have somebody read it too. Um, so th there's always this question, especially when we get into the cost, is it better to do an off the shelf device because I can then control how much memory, I can control the cost, I can control the setup versus a bundled or insurance funded device. There's definite pros and cons of those. So if you already have a device that you love and it has all the memory, then sure, we can add on. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is sometimes that the, the volume um, or the screen can't be seen outside. There's no warranty. Having to add on different switches or um, um, Bluetooth things could result in problems where things aren't always compatible. Um, so there are these options of using um, bundled insurance funded devices as well. There are lots of ways that we can um, uh, now, every day, even more things come out for your iPhone and your iPad. How do I use facial expressions? How do I use um, switch scanning with not really switch scanning, but it's uh, your face is in a, uh, a scanning. Uh, many of you have attended some of those presentations recently. Those, uh, those are definite options that can be explored by your whole team. Um, there's, and this week, we're going to learn more about the Skyle as well. So um, bundled insurance devices um, are sometimes pretty important and recommended because of the fact that we know they work together. We know they're optimized, they're rugged, they withstand daily use. Um, they, can, they used to advertise that they could be dropped and still keep on working. If you saw my iPhone, you would know it's pretty well shattered, but it still works. But you wouldn't want that to be on your communication device. 
And the thing to keep in mind is that we have to constantly adapt and change, constantly. Um, what worked last week may not work next month. So keeping in mind that we're always adapting and changing and looking, and there's new things coming out all the time. So um, we often wonder what does Medicare allow? And you can read these, these slides on your own as well. But basically speech, and we had to fight for this for a while. Um, so with this uh, Team Gleason and Steve Gleason Act, we were able to get Medicare to understand that written and text and other communication other than just speaking face-to-face -face is important because many times people with ALS are at home alone and caregivers are set to come at defined times of the day. And if that person does not show up, then there's no way to notify their loved one or their caregiver that, that the caregiver or the aide didn't show. So it was um, mind boggling to them, first of all, that people with ALS could be at home alone. And it was mind boggling to them that AIDS didn't show for some reason. So during a meeting with uh, Medicare back in 2014 or so, we were able to get them to understand that it was imperative that people with their speech generating devices was a were able to unlock their device and be able to access email, texting, um, talking with their medical doctors and phone calling. Um, so it has, you have to have Part B. So some people are, are not always aware that they need to enroll in a Part B and a Part D if they stay with traditional Medicare. So you will need to talk with your care team and figure out a plan that works for you. And again, so the uh, bundled devices need to be durable, withstand repeated use, um, have a lifespan of at least three years, um, not useful to somebody without a medical impairment. So that takes out that category of an iPhone or a tablet where somebody else could access that as well. Um, you have to have severe impairment. So some of you who have may have written reports before, um, the, the reviewers may have commented that it needs to be severe or profound. You can't say mild to moderate. So just things to keep in mind when you're writing those reports. Um, a little bit of other ideas of um, bundled devices and insurance is they come locked, meaning you could only use them for communication. Most um, the, of the vendors, we're not gonna get into the specific vendors during this talk today, have an option where you can pay out of pocket or, or have assistance from an agency to unlock those devices so that then you could, uh, you could actually get into some of these other um, internet phone, um, being able to uh, do uh, email and all of those things as well. Um, keep in mind that accessory cables that are needed to work for your communication device and your access method must be included in that bundled so things that you might need extra to, um, you know, extra ports to be able to uh, plug in a fire stick or something like that are not covered. Those are things that are out of pocket. So the AAC care team is, uh, involves the physician. There must be a face-to-face -face meeting with the, in some states vary in this in general, it's um, about six months that you have to see a physician face-to-face. With COVID, some of those face-to-face um, -face can be through televisits as well. The speech language pathologist has to write a pretty extensive report. On another slide, you'll see that. We need vendors to bring in the newest uh, releases of the equipment so that you can actually try them all out. And it is recommended that you try more than one. Um, and then your, your team, we want to keep them on our team and not an adversary is the insurance company. So the speech pathologist typically interacts with the funding device, uh, the funding team. And uh, we work together to get all of the documentation there reviewed and up to par so that your insurance can't possibly say no. So um, things, to, things to remember on here is that the assessment has to include um, a patient self-report, oral structure, motor exam, severity, all of these things are in there. The device companies do have templates where you can fill in the, under the headings. And it's also recommended that you use your, whatever agency that you've picked, whatever device you've picked to go use it their, um, their template. Um, so again, this is just for some that that was too many words on a page. This is a different visual, um, a little bit broken down with just the highlights. Um, in this point, uh, when we're talking about uh, the self-report and figuring out where we need communication, I'm going to give a shout out to Amy Luman, and hopefully she's on or sees this at some point. Um, using this type of a checklist helps the family, helps the person who's dealing with communication impairment understand that I can use different strategies 
in different places and for different things. And so having a, a kind of a framework of what we're going to use and when for different types of communication challenges also helps explain to the Medicare reviewer of why you might need uh, a speech generating device to meet some of these communication needs. So in the decision-making process, you really want to reach out to, again to the speech pathologist, the vendor, do multiple equipment de demos. Um, I recommend if it's, uh, usually you'll know within a weekend or a week if it's going to work with your situation at home. So being able to borrow a device um, to have at-home trial to see how it works in your setup. Um, sometimes the um, the vendor has um, either a loan or a short-term rental. Um, sometimes those are a fee for that. You could also demo um, the software by downloading free demo, demo communication software. So you can check out, how do I add different um, uh, communication messages? How do I set this up for me? How, how many pages do I need? What else can it do? And it's nice to have those so that you could compare and no preference for any which way if we're going to do um, grid or communicator or, or Prankyromics proprietary or talk to me technologies. It's definitely a way to look at the software. You can download those typically on a Windows computer. You can look at the apps on your um, tablets and on your iPhones as well. Thinking about now and in the future, and it's always important to highlight the safety risks. Okay. Um, again, we really have to focus on me medical necessity. So this is just another decision-making process and helping you understand what all needs to go into that report. So especially describing real life examples, safety risks and gaps in communication, looking at alternative devices, um, comparing things within the category. So we're looking at multiple access devices typically. And so we're only going to look at devices from, if you're a speech pathologist, looking at E2510, um, looking at the cost. Cost is not often um, a deciding factor because there is an allowable by Medicare and all of the device companies have fit their costs within that allowable. Um, looking at other things that you have to add on is something that might be um, uh, a decision in your just in your own personal, but those aren't things that could really be put in the device because uh, Medicare doesn't care about things that would be your out of pocket later on. Um, looking at reliability, looking at communication breakdown, looking at support, many different things that we're looking at from um, our vendors to help us um, maintain and continue the communication uh, journey and using the device that's effective. Um, so I just need to know it about access and um, insurance providers require that you list the recommendation that are least costly, least restrictive products um, necessary to meet daily functional communication need. And so if I think about me having to type every single thing with my fingers or a mouse or my hand, so either direct or assisted direct, every single thing that I'm saying here today and every single thing that I need to say all day, there's, there's probably, oh, there's another typo, Jessica. <laughs> and uh, so there, there's no way that I could type everything with my fingers or my hand. So we need to let them understand how much work that is and what kind of fatigue. So you try it out and you compare how long it takes for somebody to type something with their finger or use their mouse or use their um, use some of these other assisted director switch scanning. You then would highlight, are there more cramping or fatigue, um, not able to use their, their that, that motor skill the next day. Um, um, if we're looking at a head mouse, do we have lots more neck weakness and cramping and fatigue, shoulder pain and neck pain? So we need to look at all of these things and definitely put these in. It is important to note that eye movements are often the least fatiguing, if not the only remaining volitional movement that we have. But it's also in this next slide, um, about eight plus or minus 3.9. So the range for somebody typing with their eyes is 4.2 to 12 words per minute. Again, if we're looking at speech under 125 words per minute is not functional and is, is severe and when we're queuing um, the use for augmentative communication, we're looking at a huge shift in um, the demand for um, the caregiver and the care partner to assume a lot more of the communication, um, the functional communication and, and much more of that role. 
four to 12 words per minute with your eyes. And, and that's still better than anything that most people could do with their, with their hands. It's important to look at the keystroke saving rate. And though, by that, what we mean is documenting in your report what types of rate enhancement um, strategies are built into the software. Is there word prediction, phrase prediction, and communication, whole messages, checking on time. Um, so funding AAC, uh, what we, the only things on this uh, very wordy slide, and I should have mentioned at the beginning, I, I am a prescriber of the maximalist uh, decorating scheme. So I apologize for all of you minimalists, but um, definitely here, the things that are important it, on my screen, the bold is not showing up as, as well as I had wanted it to. Um, for Medicare funding, you have to live in your own family home, a private home, or an assisted living. You cannot live in a hospital, a skilled nursing facility, or be under hospice. And what we mean by that, and it's very, people will, are always surprised by this because they go through the communication evaluation, they get the recommendations, they send it to funding, funding says it's approved, now they have to build your device, and then they think it's safe to go on hospice to get more care or help in the home. That's not, you still cannot go on hospice. Um, enroll in hospice plan of care until that device is physically in your home. The billing date for um, the speech generating device to for Medicare to pay is the day that somebody signs that FedEx or UPS shipping label that it's at your home. So please remember that's the only thing that you remember from this talk is that we you have to be in your own private home, you have to be or in assisted living, you can't be in a skilled nursing facility, and you can't be on hospice. There are some um, situations where you could work around if you're eligible for your state Medicaid program to help pay, but in the most part, um, you definitely uh, need to adhere by these rules. So again, you have to have part B or B for DME coverage. Um, you, it's often helpful to have a supplemental or a Medicare Advantage plan to help with that additional copay. People sometimes don't look at what their high deductible, if they're on a high deductible plan, what that out of pocket is going to be. And so you might sometimes want to look at if you're getting a power wheelchair from your insurance, is it time that we should also be looking at a speech generating device? Because if you've already met your out of pocket maximum for your durable medical equipment in either way from a power wheelchair, then your copay and your costs will be much less out of pocket. So. Um, and that I, I wanted to just give you a, a very high level um, overview. I do want to let you know that there is, if you want to know more about the ASC evaluation process, there was a great talk last year um, by Sarah Schmitz, and you, you can see the link on here. You can go to the YouTube channel to see that, but there's a lot of other great um, presentations. If, if you're looking at the, the agenda for this week, and you wonder, oh, I want to learn more about voice banking, and that's not really on here this time. Please look back at these other slides where you could see these presentations in the past. If you want to learn more about um, adaptive um, AD, equipment for ADLs, such as the OB or computer access or environmental controls, please look at some of these other slides. So, and now I will open this up for questions. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that super informative presentation. Um, as she said, you can submit questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom or through the comments on Facebook. Um, I will start us off with a question. So mm -hmm. Sarah, in the past, gave a great presentation. You can look back at, for sure, about the AT evaluation process. But could you kind of touch on what that looks like for a person living with ALS or for a family, what they should expect? Sure, that's a great question to start over. I, I glossed on it a little bit. So when you see your doctor, uh, the doctor would start out with a referral for a speech, um, a speech and language assessment for speech generating device. So that's that face-to-face -face piece. It, then if you're involved with a multidisciplinary team, a member of the team or somebody ancillary to that team as a speech pathologist, probably is your expert for assistive technology and in, in, um, speech generating devices. So the referral will go to that speech pathologist who will then schedule the evaluation. Um, if you can make it to the clinic, that would be great. Uh, but then again, it gets coordinated with the vendor 
to get there. Um, part of the evaluation is a general speech and language evaluation piece. So we're looking at what, uh, um, what is the intelligibility? What do you have any communication breakdown? Is your, are your words difficult to understand? How much do your caregivers understand? How much do people who aren't familiar with you understand? How much do your medical providers understand? And often there's several different ratings for that. There are also some um, formal assessments looking at dysarthria assessments and speech intelligibility. There's the speech rate evaluation where they might have you read a passage, oftentimes a grandfather passage or a rainbow passage. There's different passages that then it would be calculated of your rate of speech. Um, an intelligibility could also be um, um, uh, factored from that as well. So once we have an idea of um, a needs assessment as well as part of that is looking at who are you communicating with each day? What's your environment? Um, where are you sitting? What type of device do we need? What type of access do you have with your hand skills, typing skills, mouse, um, head mouse, head movements, all of those things, then we develop a short list of technology that we would recommend that you look at. And oftentimes families come to me and they said, well, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a Facebook group or I, I know somebody who had this type of device. Can we look at that? Absolutely. We can look at whatever device that you want to look at or that you've heard about. So we make the contact with the vendor. We have them come and arrange to either meet with you at home, come to the, the meeting, See if there's, once we narrow it down to one or two, then I have, typically what I do is I have you try it out for a week or a weekend and see what, which device really works for you and your caregivers and which works within your life. Once that's developed, you have to, the speech pathologist then writes a report, um, all of those things that Medicare requires. There's paperwork that the family has to assign, um, client information form, copies of your insurance cards, front and back, um, assignment of benefits, understanding that you're giving permission for the vendor to talk to your insurance company on your, on your behalf, and that you, they, you are giving them, the insurance company, permission to pay the vendor. Um, so that's that assignment of benefits. And there were, in the past, cases where the family actually took the money from the insurance company and was going to buy the device, and then something happened, and they spent the money on, on another thing, and they never got the communication device. That would be a misuse of funds. So that's the, they don't do that anymore. So there's a lot of other paperwork with that. And like we said, it could take between 8 to 12 weeks before that device is actually in your home. Okay. Well, well, and then I guess I should talk about that. Once it's, once it's there, um, typically the vendor will come out and help you with the first initial setups. So uh, I like to tell people, get it out of the box, plug it in, uh, get it charged up. If it's able to connect to your internet, that would be great. You could run some of the updates. In most cases, you'll have to un purchase an unlock code first to get that connected to your internet so that then you can get the updates in, have the vendor come, help you set up all of those things, arrange uh, your homepage how you like it, and then get busy starting to customize. You should be enrolled in speech therapy for four to six weeks per se, just to get you going on um, lots of goals and setting up your functional goals. And then you'll be put on a follow-up. So you'll be seen at clinic every three months or so, then or on a tickler list that we reach out to make sure that you're doing okay. It doesn't, you don't need any updates. Great, so we had a question. Do companies have long-term loaner devices? Most companies do not have long-term loaner companies because, or loaner devices on the companies because there's always a shortage and a high demand of these. So that's when you would check with your local ALS group to see if they have a loaner, check with your assistive technology program and, and see what types of loaners are out there. It, there are some workarounds with the free demos, but in most cases, long-term loaners are not options. What if insurance won't cover my device? Can it be appealed? What happens then? So yes, you can appeal. And so depending on how the, um, the decision comes back from the insurance company, uh, what, they, what was the reason for denial, there are definitely ways to appeal. So you would start out with a paperwork process of appealing first and then go up the chain. Typically, you might have to ask for um, a doctor, an intervention with the, with the doctor to hear with the, with the vendor as well. Um, 
I've been very fortunate and I have never had to get to that level, thankfully. Um, but there are some insurances that still consider these out of net, not out of network or uncovered devices or exclusionary. So there are sometimes ways, depending on who your insurance provider is and what your company is. It's com it could be possible that your um, your insurance navigator at your company in HR doesn't even know that it's an un uncovered benefit or an excluded benefit. So we can sometimes start there. If it's a small company, there, there could be ways that that could be allowed through without having to go through a formal appeal process. Um, there are some times though where you may need to use a device. Um, there are times when insurance doesn't cover it, like when you're on hospice or uh, if you're in a, a, a nursing home and still paying out of pocket, those are when we would use loaner devices from, the, um, from your ALS agency from the ALS Association or other groups. So those would be long-term loaners when there is no insurance coverage. So we had a participant say, we may not have the luxury of eight to 12 weeks to wait. Can you recommend something else to use in the meantime, even something low tech? Yeah, so hopefully your speech pathologist when you were going through the evaluation based on that checklist, I'll see if I can get back to there. Um, oops, on this one. Based on this checklist, you should have a multimodal communication system set up and spec'd out for you with your family and the speech pathologist. So there are often many, many, many other ways that we do this through letter boards or apps on your phone if you have um, hand use. We use laser pointers and paper communication. There are many other things that you should have in place um, if you're fortunate enough to uh, be covered by an agency that does have short-term or long-term, um, there are some companies will loan you a device as long as you're going through the insurance process. So the goal is that through an ALS agency, that there will be a device for you to use while you're waiting for yours to come in. It may not be the most newest one with the, the most up-to-date technology, but it could work for you as a stopgap measure until yours comes in through insurance. So again, uh, it's imperative that you look at how all the different ways that you're looking at alerting, how else you're able to communicate with people in your environment and see where those breakdowns are. And then if you look at the examples in the intervention, hopefully there are, is something that will fit with those as you're waiting for your insurance, your insurance funded device to come in. Yeah, I would also put a plug in for reaching out to your assistive technology team with the ALS Association. Um, we will definitely try to, to help you troubleshoot and fill in gaps where we can, as well as your medical team and SLP and all of those people. All right, well, I don't see any more questions right now, but I think Lisa was kind enough to include her contact information on the last Ooh. slide. So we'll if you come up with something after this presentation, Oops. Um, oh, there we go. You can reach out to Lisa on her email or voice or text. It looks like someone had raised their hand. Did you have a question? I don't know if I can like call on you like this is school when you have your hands raised. So I don't know. <laughs> I have to put it in the Q&A. Type it in the chat. Yeah. While we're waiting for that, I, I want to thank um, Reagan and Jessica again for inviting me to give this overview and the process of how to get a speech generating device. So someone has asked, did the theory of everything demo these devices? Repeat that again, the theory of everything. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Did the, Did theory of everything demo these devices? So, um, so Stephen Hawking is one of the probably most well-known people who use a, a speech generating device. His device was um, uh, Words Plus on an old, old, old Windows computer, and um, he used uh, lots of blink or twitches with his cheek at first. And um, but speech generating devices and the technology has been around since the 70s and 80s. 
uh, we used to have to use big, huge honking computers and connected to the computer uh, for access method. Um, but the, the, the philosophy of how do we um, turn text to speech into spoken speech, how do we do shorthand forms of that, um, is definitely was part of Stephen Hawking's and that his theory of everything he had. Um, there was a little pop-up window with uh, message numbers that you could use. There was also um, uh, logical letter codes that we use at a time. So everyone might know this from uh, Tigger, TTFN, Tata for now. So those are logical letter codes. We know them all now because they're short for texting, LOL, um, ROFL, those are those things as well. Many people can use those. And um, we no longer have to be physically connected to our device through. So I'm hoping I answered your question. If not, um, I have a little more detail. Yeah, I'm glad you made that connection. I, I was confused, but that makes total sense. Theory of everything, Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Um, we had another question. So can you talk about resources for training with a device if you're on hospice? So um, definitely reach out to your local ALS association. Um, if you're not in a chapter or a territory that has assistive technology professional yet, there are agencies that you could reach out as well. Um, you could reach out to the Team Gleason has help, Bridging Voice has help, lots of other um, agencies and professionals that are there to help you. Um, you can reach out to me. Uh, we'll get you connected. We're working on a list of volunteers who could uh, connect with you via Zoom. Um, and so there's lots, lots and lots of help out there, way more than it ever has been. And it's so much easier since COVID. Um, and you definitely should not um, forego communication or technology or a plan, even if you're on hospice. So again, reach out to your local ALS Association care team. They will know where to refer you and where to get help. And agencies are available across the U.S. to help with this. So what if you are in long-term care, skilled nursing, before your voice goes? So the long-term care issue, if you are paying out of pocket and you're getting skilled care in a nursing home, Medicare considers them the benefit, they should be providing all of your DME for you. So if you think about it, you're, when you go to a hospital, you're not getting charged a rental fee for the hospital bed. You're not getting charged a rental fee for a Hoyer lift or any of those types of things. But so since speech generating devices are on the DME code, they, they fall into that benefit category. They won't cover them because they expect a facility to, to cover those for you. Again, reach out to your association, reach out to your state um, assistive tech plan. And there are devices available somewhere, somehow, some, there will be a way for you to be able to communicate, I'm sure of it. So we would work on that. Um, it may be that we're using um, adapting a laptop computer and adding on these things for you. It may not be the most portable. It may not be the most, um, might have cables and things hanging off of it, but you'll be able to communicate. All right, well, I don't see any further questions right now. I'll give another minute if you wanna put your questions in. Thank you everybody for your great questions. Thank you. While we're waiting. I think this is probably the first time I've ever finished early, you guys. <laughs> um, I'm just going to remind everyone that we have presentations every day this week at 11 a.m. Lisa was so nice to include the list at the beginning of her presentation. Um, also, they will be recorded on, you, know, you can find them on Facebook. It's being played again on Zoom at 3 p.m. or it will be on our YouTube channel, which has been shared in the chat. Um, if you have questions afterwards, you can reach out to Lisa through, whoop. there we go. That's the rest of the week for Technology Week. So come see us tomorrow for iTech Digital, which is an eye gaze company. They make eye gaze devices. So that's kind of connected to what we were talking about today. Um, if you have questions after this presentation, you can reach out to Lisa at her provided contacts, or you can reach out to your AT team. 
and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you so much, everyone.